Far-reaching encounter with the inside of a car. Driving a sputtering hand-me-down Mercedes from Boston all the way to the Midwest, Falk only just made it into town. A colleague introduced Falk to Mercedes repair whiz Walter Anwander. Anwander offered to rebuild the Mercedes's failing engine and threw in a lecture on car radiators for free. It was to give him a place in the annals of paleontology. Walter said that the engine could only be as large as the radiator was capable of cooling. I didn't think anything of it at the time. It was just rumbling around in the attic. But later, Walter's description of my car's radiator turned out to be a clue to solving one of the greatest puzzles in human evolution. The puzzle involves our big, complex brains. New ideas about how our brains evolved have been inspired by looking at the physics of heat. Physiologist Peter Wheeler thinks that supercomputers like this Cray mimic processes that evolved in our ancestors millions of years ago. All information processing systems fuse a lot of energy, and that energy ends up as heat. You can only design a very powerful computer such as this one or evolve a large brain if you can dissipate that heat because both systems are easily damaged by the heat they're producing. Now, to cool a large computer like this one is a very difficult task. One possible solution would be to disperse the circuits, spread them further apart. But that doesn't work because you're slowing the machine down. The Cray design team came up with a radical solution. They immersed the densely wired circuits in a bath of cooling fluorocarbons. The problem Wheeler posed was this. How did our densely packed brains find a way to cool off? Humans are different from close relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas because we have brains three times as large and because we walk upright. The great mystery of human origins is that we became big-brained bipedal primates under the hot sun of the African savannas. Human evolution has been called an east side story. In the Great Rift Valley of East Africa, paleontologists continue to uncover the fossil remains of upright walking primates, the early hominids. Today, the landscape where our ancestors took their first steps is hot and dry, just as it was millions of years ago. And these are the hard facts, the fossilized fragments of our past, some more than three million years old. The oldest hominids are known as Australopithecines. Fossils provide the most important evidence about the origins of our unique bodies and behavior. But there is little agreement on what they tell us about the ape that stood up. Walking upright is not a popular design solution among mammals. Human babies spend a year learning to get off all fours and walk. And for an animal evolving in Africa, becoming a biped was positively dangerous. Walking bipedally is no more energetically effective than walking in a quadrupedal fashion. At the same time, walking bipedally does make you much more slow and much more awkward. It means that you're more susceptible to predation because you don't have the speed and agility of a quadruped. It also means that you're relying on only two limbs to support your body mass where you used to rely on four. This in increases the load on your hind limbs. It makes you more prone to injury. It makes your skeleton more prone to degradation. In general, it's just a very, very poor way of locomoting. One can conduct a simple mind experiment in which uh, in an enclosure you put a hungry lion, uh, a human, uh, a chimpanzee, uh, let's put in as well a baboon and, and a dog. And the question is which of those four individuals is going to be eaten first? And without question, it will be the human. In 1978, the mystery of bipedalism deepened. At Lightly in northern Tanzania, paleontologist Mary Leakey discovered what's been called an action fossil. It was a trail of footprints. The discovery was one of the most dramatic in the history of paleontology.
About three and a half million years ago, between the rainy and dry seasons, a volcano was spewing out great clouds of ash periodically. And sometimes the ash would come out and fall on the landscape, and then a light rain would fall and turn it into the consistency of wet concrete. And then over time, it went through other chemical changes, which cons uh, preserved it. And then the volcano would blow off again, and more rain. And in fact, you get layer upon layer of footprint-bearing tufts, as they are called. They're all going north, and they're quite closely parallel with one another. And a third individual partially overprinted the tracks of its predecessor in the second trail. So in fact, you have three individuals making two trails. These prints are extremely humanoid. When you look at all of the prints and take all information into account and stress the better prints, you come out with a highly human sort of foot. The lightly feet through paleontology into disarray. The classic idea of bipedalism is something that I've called the 2001 theory after that wonderful opening sequence of the film 2001. And it was that bipedalism and freeing of the forelimbs and tool production and brain evolution all went hand in hand, that they all evolved together as a package, that when the earliest hominids became bipedal, the hands were freed, the hands produced tools, uh, it took intelligence to produce tools, so there was a feedback on the brain, the brain in increased in size. The problem was the age of the lighterly footprints. Bipedalism was at least 3.5 million years old. However, the brains of fossil hominids found at that point were very, very small. So we, here we had evidence of bipedalism, and it was not connected to a large brain. Rather, the feet preceded, uh, by a good amount of time, the increase in brain size. The gap between feet and brains was reinforced by another discovery at Hadar in Ethiopia's Afar Desert. The find was a fossil skeleton 40% complete, named Lucy after the Beatles song. Oh, wow. The fossil suggested that Lucy's brain was little bigger than a chimp's, but there was every sign that she had walked upright. So American Don Johansson was certain he had found a three million year old missing link, our oldest ancestor. The team also found several other hominids, christened the first family. These fossils were older than Lucy and very varied in size. At first, Johansson was certain he had found more than one species. One of the distinctive characters of Lucy's mandible was her very V-shaped profile. In contrast to that, on the other hand, we have a number of mandibles which show more advanced characteristics of the mandible in the sense of being more U-shaped, which means that, in fact, it's more advanced than Lucy, and we think that this is probably referable to the genus Homo. To see the difference between the two mandibles, it's most easy to do that by holding them up, looking at them in profile like this. And Lucy, which is on your right, shows the very V-shaped mandible, and the mandible on your left is much more U-shaped in profile. Lucy became one of the most celebrated of all fossil discoveries. Like the lighterly footprints, she seemed to hold the promise of solving the puzzle of why we walked upright. It was this feature of Lucy that linked her to modern humans across three million years. Johansson brought casts of the Ethiopian fossils, including Lucy, to the bone room of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. The Maka humerus is this thing that we found in uh, 1990. So in comparing this bone with the Lucy bone... The Cleveland scientists convinced Johansson that he had found a single species, and that it was one unknown to science. So Lucy and the first family were lumped together and given a scientific name, Australopithecus afarensis, after the Afar desert. So we're talking about a different kind of dimorphism. In 1993, discoveries at Maka in Ethiopia appeared to confirm that there was a single species.
If we were to take a trip through time and go back into the past, we'd get to the three million year mark and we'd encounter Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. She's geologically one of the younger specimens. If we were to stay in the afar and go back another half a million years, we'd come to Maka. At Maka, we have the same species, Australopithecus afarensis. If we were to then get in a Land Rover three and a half million years ago and drive way down to Tanzania, we would find the same hominid species, afarensis, but in a very different habitat. As well as fossils, the Cleveland collection also contains the skeletal remains of hundreds of quadrupeds, like chimps and gorillas. According to Owen Lovejoy, Lucy is very different from these four-legged relatives. When we look at Lucy's skeleton, we can tell from her ankle joint, her foot, her great toe, her knee joint, and other parts of her anatomy, and especially her pelvis, that we're dealing with an animal that not only is bipedal, but it's been so for a long period of time because all of the major changes that you associate uh, with bipedality in a skeleton are present in Lucy. If we compare her pelvis, for example, to one from a common chimpanzee, there's a dramatic difference in all of the major elements that are related to locomotion. And it's not just the pelvis. If Lucy was like a modern biped, she wouldn't be climbing trees like chimps. One clue would be arm length. This discovery is a rather complete upper arm bone called the humerus. This is the bone that goes right here in the anatomy. And you can see that this is quite a large individual, much larger than Lucy. Lucy's humerus is also quite complete. So now we have the comparison, male, a large male, to female, a small female, substantial difference in overall size, but also in shape. And what we find is that this comparison shows the males to have been heavily muscled, very stocky, and a very short arm bone relative to primates who live in trees. But why walk upright if it might get you eaten? Lovejoy argues that bipedal male looses could forage over longer distances to provide for female looses. This would let females devote their energy to reproducing. What we have is an animal in the form of an ape who is spending an enormous amount of its energy investing it in a single offspring. And the chances of that offspring surviving over this long period of care uh, are good, but it means that the reproductive rate of the animal is very, very low. One way out of this conundrum is to reduce the amount of energy you spend on feeding and to reduce the amount of energy that you spend on obtaining safety, if you can do that, then the amount of energy that you can put into reproduction can greatly increase. The latest reconstruction of Lucy is in New York's Natural History Museum. The exhibit reflects the general scientific acceptance that the Cleveland team had got it right. But since Lucy's discovery, other scientists have worked on the same fossils and are challenging White and Lovejoy's conclusions and methods. Lucy is a very strange animal in our field because she was so much popularized. Everybody sees Lucy as this young female walking more or less bipedally and so on. But uh, it's difficult to fight against this image. And it's very difficult for us who are dealing with the bones to say, OK, be careful. It's maybe not a real female. It may not be a real true biped. It may not be this kind of animal eating this kind of thing. And it's difficult to fight against received ideas. I think one of the things that hampers modern paleoanthropological research is so much of it is controlled by so few people. Uh, I think for certainly uh, human origins research, I think you could count on the fingers of one hand the number of individual men that control access to virtually every important fossil uh, in, the, in the world. And I think the, the, the problem with that is that the the science, in a way, isn't as open as it should be to new ideas. Old ideas tend to be perpetuated, and the same people perpetuate those ideas. But the Lucy file is being reopened. First, what sex was she? Laurie Hager has questioned Johansson's conclusion that Lucy's wide pelvis meant that she had to be female. The reason we have sex differences is because females are bearing fairly large infants and it is in their best interest to have a larger pelvis to get those infants out. Now, 
In the Australopithecines, where they're small-brained and small-bodied, there wouldn't necessarily be the same sort of selective pressures to have a large maternal pelvis. And that raises another problem. Some primates, like these gorillas, exhibit sexual dimorphism. The males are bigger than the females. The first family fossils were varied in size. Johansen and White argued that this was because there were big males and small females. There are species that are highly sexually dimorphic, like in the gorilla and the orang, where the males are twice as large as the females. And then there are species that are monomorphic, where you can't tell the male from the female quite as easily. Um, part of the problem of, uh, with fossils and talking about sexual dimorphism in other primates is which primate do you choose? Do you choose the gorilla or the orang as um, a non-human primate model? to uh, suggest what sexual dimorphism was in the early hominids? Or do you take something like the chimpanzee, which is only, it has uh, sexual dimorphism in the range of modern humans? I think it could be argued, and quite reasonably, that our earliest ancestors were not highly sexually dimorphic. So, if it's not males and females, why are the fossils so different? In Paris, a group of paleontologists have been analyzing the Ethiopian evidence. The picture they have constructed of Lucy is very different from that of their Cleveland colleagues. Yves Copins thinks that Johansen was right first time about the number of species. I think we were right for the wrong reasons. At that time, we were very impressed by the differences of size. Of, uh, of the material of the teeth, especially the proportion of the teeth. And uh, after that, we realized that it was not a question of differences of size, but a question of differences of shape because of differences of locomotion and, and behavior. If we take Lucy, which is a, really a key fossil for us, if you compare the, the distal part of the humerus, one thing which is very important is the articular surface, which is very important to stabilize the joint during climbing activities. And you can almost see no difference between Lucy and Chim. If you look at modern man, modern man doesn't climb trees. You see this crest is very badly developed. So Lucy didn't look like a modern biped. Then Senu examined one of the first family fossil elbows, and this one didn't look like a Lucy at all. In this animal, you can see that this crest is very poorly developed, and it looks more like a modern human. The other thing is when you look at modern chimps, you get a kind of straightness of the lateral area of the bone, which is exactly the same in Lucy. If you look at a modern human, you get this narrowing up shaft. And if you look at this one, you get also this kind of narrowing. And this is definitely, for me, homo-like. So this could be another kind of hominid, living alongside Lucy and perhaps closer to ourselves. Lucy is in contemporaneity with uh, another hominid, much more modern hominid, which could be homo. So if you have homo, close to, to Lucy. Lucy cannot be the ancestor of Homo. Russell Tuttle and Kevin Hunt have uncovered other problems with the Cleveland view of Lucy. They have looked at modern primate behavior to explain the origins of walking upright. Hunt studied chimps in Tanzania. He thinks that our very distant ancestors stood up to chow down. What I discovered when I returned and began to look at my observations of bipedalism in, in chimpanzees was that chimpanzees were bipedal under two circumstances. And on the ground, they stood up and reached into the trees to gather fruits. But then after they finished gathering as many as they could from the ground, uh, they climbed up into the trees and they began to harvest fruits bipedally uh, with an arm hanging type of positional behavior as, as well. So they stabilized their body among these tiny branches where they couldn't sit very efficiently and um, gathered fruits with an arm hanging bipedalism. Hunt questions the claim that Lucy had come all the way down from the trees. The clue is in the shape of the upper body. A chimpanzee has a torso that's more shaped like an object that has all of its stress evenly distributed across the entire 
torso. The, the example that I use is of a water droplet, which um, forms with a balance between the surface tension of the, the water and the weight of the droplet. And its, um, its stress is perfectly evenly distributed around the entire surface of the droplet. And that water droplet shape, that cone shaped at the top, bulging at the bottom, is something that's very similar to the torso and the bulging belly of a, of a chimpanzee. Hunt noticed that Luce's torso was cone-shaped too. She probably had uh, some ability, perhaps not as, as um, great as, as that of a chimpanzee, but certainly much more than, than is the case in modern humans. She had the ability to cause her torso to assume this teardrop shape, which is very efficient for arm hanging. Hunt's work appears to support the conclusions of the French team. But could a chimp like Lucy have made the modern-looking Lytoli footprints? At Lytoli, you have evidence of footprints which show a biped locomoting across that savanna woodland habitat. You have fossil remains, such as this adult mandible of Australopithecus afarensis. These match up with the adult remains that are new from Maka in Ethiopia. This is the same species, the species responsible for the bones, the footprints. The only hominid species we have is this highly successful creature known as Australopithecus afarensis. There are some primitive features in, in this print, and now that I've seen the prints a little bit uh, and examined them briefly, um, it's, uh, it, it looks less primitive perhaps. Russell Tuttle has been trying to match the feet from Ethiopia with the footprints, and he stumbled on a problem. I do not think that the foot bones found from there could make a foot that would make a print that is virtually human. The uh, lateral toes, that is apart from the big toe, the other four toes are simply too longish and especially too curved to make a footprint uh, to, to fit comfortably within uh, the Lytoli footprints. Uh, it would be rather like trying to get one of Cinderella's stepsisters crammed into the glass slipper. It simply doesn't fit. If you look at the skeletons of the earliest known hominids, for instance, Lucy's skeleton, she is not simply a miniature version of a contemporary human skeleton. It's true her form does suggest that she walked on her hind limbs. However, the details of the anatomy aren't as refined as our own. And if one looks over the entire hominid fossil record, it suggests to me that bipedalism was refined over hundreds of thousands of years. If that trackway was made by a Lucy-type Australopithecine, then we can say quite conclusively that these animals were fairly good bipeds moving through open country. If, on the other hand, Lucy-type Australopithecines weren't good bipeds, then something else was out there and something else made the Lytoli trackway. So the picture seems to be more complicated. According to White and Johansson, Lucy was the ancestor of all later hominids, the Australopithecines, and eventually ourselves. But another camp argues that there are at least two species jumbled up, one leading to an extinct branch of the Australopithecines, the other towards modern humans. Where does this leave Lucy? That might depend on what kind of Australopithecine she most closely resembles. On the one hand, you have the so-called robust Australopithecines, and as you can tell, they have very large faces, big cheekbones, and a large crest of bone running down the top of the head. That's for chewing muscles. And they have these enormous back teeth. What these creatures were was basically chewing machines. The second kind of Australopithecine is the so-called grassal Australopithecine. This is a very famous skull. Mrs. Pless, notice that she lacks the bony crest running down the middle of the skull and her face isn't nearly as large. And the Grassoostolopithecines did not have as large of molars. We know, for instance, that robust Australopithecines have already gone down an evolutionary path to an extent where they could not have evolved into contemporary Homo sapiens. They're just too specialized. The grassal Australopithecines, on the other hand, are more generalized in some features, and it's quite possible that grassal Australopithecines gave rise to early Homo, that is, to our own genus, and that early Homo, over time, evolved into Homo sapiens. <laughs> Uh, 
At the beginning of the 1980s, Dean Falk began working with scientists in St. Louis at the Washington University Medical School. Her work here would link the problem of Lucy's identity with the mystery of bipedalism. A paleontologist at the medical school, Glenn Conroy, had been using body scanning techniques to reveal hidden structures in fossils. Falk had noticed a curious feature in a collection of endocasts, which are made from the inside of fossil skulls. She wanted to compare her finding with Conroy's. I went to Nairobi, and what I saw was in the back part of the endocast, which is inside the back part of the skull, there was a feature in some specimens, but not in others, which is a big groove. You see it right here. And this is a channel for conducting blood out of the skull. This is called the occipital marginal venous sinus. And it was very, very large and dramatic in not only this specimen, but in all endocasts from robust osteolipithecines that have this area represented. What really interested me was when they allowed me to look at casts of the Hadar hominids from Ethiopia, those fossils also had this enlarged occipital marginal sinus. So the Hadar early hominids shared this very dramatic feature for conducting blood out of the skull with robust australopithecines and apparently only with robust australopithecines. The standard way for blood in, let's say, modern humans uh, to come back to the heart we have a midline sagittal sinus, so the blood from the brain basically flows up toward the midline, comes back toward the posterior part of the brain, and then divides into left and right transverse sinuses, which then ultimately dump into the internal jugular uh, venous system. In modern humans, and in gracile australopithecines, the blood returns to the heart through the transverse sinus. In robusts and the afarensis fossils, blood flow takes a different route through the occipital marginal sinus. But if afarensis shares this important feature with the robusts, how could Lucy have been our ancestor? We saw a feature in robust australopithecines, but not in gracile australopithecines, which also existed in A. afarensis. So both the Lucy fossils and robust australopithecines had this dramatic enlarged occipital marginal sinus, and we thought that that was, um, was too much to be coincidence. Glenn and I published our observations in Nature. It was not well received by paleoanthropologists who accepted the Johansson and White uh, phylogeny. It's very common, and it's ideal, to have everything that you find be the ancestor of everything else. And that's that sort of methodology has plagued paleoanthropology uh, you know, ever since uh, really its inception. And so I think part of the reason that this idea wasn't accepted with open arms was that it would have made the Hadar sa sample, or at least part of it, not ancestral to everything else. And that's usually a hard pill for some people to swallow. Okay, guys, this is the moment of truth. Falk and Conroy used the hospital technology to scan fossils difficult to analyze with the naked eye. The pattern was the same. Robusts and graciles had different ways of getting blood out of the skull. But what did that have to do with bipedalism? image of the flow of the blood out of the brain, that is the venous... Scans of living subjects reveal that there is an important biological process that links the brain with walking upright, and that's blood flow. Flowing liquids must respect the laws of gravity, and all animals, including ourselves, have tailored patterns of blood flow to posture. When we are upright, blood has to make its way out of the back of the skull through the vertebral venous plexus. It was noticed in neck surgery of patients with cancers in, in the neck that when their heads were tilted up about 30 degrees on the operating table, one would expect a very bloody surgical feel because you have all you would have expected all this blood pooling in the neck. Turned out the feel wasn't bloody at all, and so blood was not coming back by the internal jugular veins, which everyone would have expected, uh, but instead the blood clearly was draining from the brain via another route, and this vertebral venous plexus was the route. What we began to realize was that this enlarged OM sinus has connections to the plexus of veins that surround the spinal cord, to that vertebral plexus of veins. And it's exactly this plexus that we use when we're in an upright posture. So we wondered 
if this enlarged OM sinus wasn't an adaptation in conjunction with the refinement of bipedalism. So evolving into a biped meant there had to be a lot of re-plumbing, especially in the head. The robusts and graciles seem to have evolved different ways of getting blood back to the heart. Why? Folk would come back to this puzzle and it would turn out to be connected with heat. While Folk was cat scanning fossil skulls, Peter Wheeler was thinking about what our ancestors had been up to out in the midday sun. It's been known for some time that hominids appeared when global climates were in upheaval. The densely woven forest canopies of the African tropics thinned and fragmented. Exposed to the sun, the new savannas became hot and arid, as they are today. Although savanna is often thought of as areas of open grass and such as this one here, the term also covers a much wider range of more diverse habitats, including the more vegetated areas beyond, areas of bushland or even semi-woodland. But the important feature of all of these habitats is the shielding canopy has gone, and therefore much higher levels of solar radiation are reaching the ground, exposing the animals living in these areas to higher levels of heat and water stress. This is one of the most hostile environments on the planet for large mammals to deal with, and anything that's gonna make it out here has got to be able to cope with the heat stress. It's now just reached noon, and we're now moving into the hottest period of the day, and this is when animals are going to be exposed to the most thermal stress. They've got to cope not just with very high air temperatures, but also very strong fluxes of solar radiation. Most savannah animals don't try and keep the whole body cool during this period. It'd simply be too expensive in terms of the amount of water they would need. What they do is let some of the heat accumulate within their bodies, and of course this causes their body temperature to rise throughout the day. They store this heat until nightfall, when the temperature drops markedly in these open country areas, and they're therefore able to lose the heat without having to use scarce water. Animals are only able to use that strategy if they can protect the most delicate areas of the body, in particular the brain. And what most savannah animals have is a fairly large muzzle, and it's evaporation from the linings of that muzzle that cools down the venous blood draining from it back into the head. It there enters a countercurrent heat exchanger, and that cools the hot blood flowing from the body to the brain. So rather than expending a lot of water to keep the whole body cool, they're using a relatively limited amount of water to selectively cool the brain. The problem for our ancestors would have been that apes lack both a large muzzle and also they don't have the network of blood vessels at the base of the brain. You need to get brain cooling. Therefore, the only way they can protect their brains from overheating is by preventing any elevations in body temperature itself. Wheeler suspected that walking upright could give an animal powerful advantages in the hot savannas. He started with a common sense observation that bipedalism lifts more of the body above the ground. I've just set up two identical temperature sensors here. The one on the left has been placed close to the ground surface in the shade, and the right-hand one some six feet above it in this small acacia bush, also in the shade. And as we can see, there's some considerable difference in the readings of the two sensors. The one near the ground is reaching temperatures of almost 20 degrees centigrade higher than the more elevated one. This is showing us the airspeed as the vanes turn in the wind, the speed is being electronically measured by the device and near the ground, wind speeds, as you can see, are relatively slow. Up here, the air is both cooler and much faster moving. And in fact, I can already feel the cooling effect of the breeze blowing across my face now. What bipedalism is doing is it's moving more of the body surfaces further away from that hot ground and placing them in these cooler and faster moving air streams where more heat will be carried away from the body by the process of convection. And of course, that doesn't use scarce water. In fact, we calculate in typical conditions, a biped will be losing something like a third more heat by convection than a quadruped. The next clue is in the relationship between posture and the angle of the sun. It's just after dawn, and already the sun's starting to rise in the sky. 
And at this time of day, all animals, both quipeds and quadrupeds, are exposing a considerable amount of their body surfaces to the sun. An idea of just how much can be seen by looking at the long shadow behind me here. But at this time of day, this isn't really that much of a problem because the intensity of the radiation at the Earth's surface is relatively low. Close to noon, the sun's radiation is really fierce at these latitudes, but I'm casting a much smaller shadow now. That means I'm exposing less of my skin to the incoming rays. If I was a quadruped, I'd still be exposing about the same area of body that I was this morning. But could this be made more precise? A model hominid called Boris came up with the figures that fleshed out Wheeler's speculation. This has been proportioned as accurately as possible. The joints are fully articulated so that Boris can be posed in a variety of positions and then using a tracking camera system, we can photograph him from a range of angles representing the sun at different times of day. And then by scanning those negatives, we can actually calculate very precisely the areas this animal might have exposed to the sun throughout a solar day. At high noon, the quadrupedal Boris exposes 17% of its body to the fierce heat of the sun. But the biped has reduced that to 7%. That's a 40% difference. Some anthropologists doubt whether the answer lies in the hot savannas. They would have been too barren and dangerous for defenseless early hominids to venture into. Wheeler argues that with the forest canopy thinned all over East Africa, heat stress had to be a factor. Scattered savanna trees would have given refuge from predators, but not from the sun. Does the fossil evidence suggest that human evolution was shaped by heat? The National Museum of Kenya in Nairobi contains some of the most important fossils in the world. There was one fossil individual that Wheeler was especially interested in. This is a cast of the skeleton of the Takana boy. And what strikes you almost immediately about this fossil is its size. Although the boy was only about nine years old at the time of his death, it's been estimated that he already reached a height of five and a half feet. And if he'd continued to grow, he probably would have stood over six feet tall and weighed more than 60 kilograms. This large mass of body tissue is usually associated as an adaptation to the cold to help try and retain heat within the body tissues. But we found that a large body is also very good in hot, very arid conditions where it slows down the gain of heat and the loss of water. This means that large animals will dehydrate more slowly they are therefore able to go longer without drinking and therefore can cover greater distances. In the hot region of Lake Turkana, modern people show the same kind of adaptation. The tall, linear physique of the El Molo is typical of many human populations in the hot, arid regions of the tropics. A tall, thin body maximizes the skin area to lose heat, but at the same time minimizes exposure to overhead sun. We are still standing tall to stay cool. Wheeler suspects that walking upright evolved along with a naked skin and complex sweat glands. Together with bipedalism, these might have given our ancestors the key to survival in the hot African savannas and tipped the balance between life and death. Wheeler's work suggested one solution to why the feet had gone first. The brain couldn't get any larger until it could be cooled. And so we had to stand upright long before we evolved large brains. But was this the whole story? And why did blood flow in different ways in different hominids? Meanwhile, Dean Falk had continued her work on blood flow in fossil skulls and endocasts. When Glenn and I drew our conclusions about the enlarged occipital marginal sinus system and suggested that it was in response to refinement of bipedalism, we were asked, how is it that we as bipeds manage to go ahead surviving without this high frequency of enlarged OM sinuses? So this is a new question, and it was a fair one. And so more work needed to be done. At that point, uh, I approached the question uh, from the point of view of comparative anatomy. And so what I did was everything. I did skulls of apes, uh, including chimps and gorillas, skulls of modern humans, and then every fossil I could find. 
Falk was interested in tiny holes in fossil skulls known as emissary foramina. There are lots of these in modern skulls, but very few in gorillas and chimps. In living humans, the foramina allow blood vessels to penetrate the skull and enter the brain. So the small holes in fossil skulls are evidence of blood flow patterns. In the lineage leading to ourselves, that is Grassalostolopithecines and early Homo on up to and including ourselves, the frequencies of the emissary foramina, particularly the ones at the top and the sides of the skull, increased dramatically. This suggested to me that the vascularization of the cranium had undergone an evolution and had become more complex through time, perhaps in conjunction with the refinement of bipedalism. And this was linked to the difference between the robust Australopithecines and later hominids. The extinct robusts stand out dramatically with their odd blood flow pattern. As brains enlarge in our direct ancestors, the pattern of blood drainage becomes more complex and the number of foramina increases over time. Could different plumbing layouts give one kind of bipedal hominid the edge over another in those hot savannas? Falk published the results without drawing any conclusions about what they meant. Then she received a letter from a French physiologist. And in this letter he said, Dear Dr. Falk, your paper has aroused intense interest in our team. It is possible that foramina and sinuses were developed for the defense of the brain temperature. The brain size has increased with bipedalism. The brain thermolytic needs have increased with this increasing size. The, the enclosed, enclosed reprints, reprints defend, defend the, the hypothesis, hypothesis that, that there is selective cooling of the human brain during hyperthermia and provide evidence that at least some of the cooling is transported to the brain via emissary veins. I would be interested in hearing from you. Very sincerely yours, Michelle Kabanak. She had discovered that the size and the number of emissary foramina was increasing with human evolution. And that was, for us, thrilling. Now, this will be noisy, but it doesn't hurt. Kabanak had been doing experiments to find out if the brain has its own specialized cooling system. In this one, he is studying the direction of blood flow in the head using a Doppler probe. Now we have it. And you see the blood flows from brain to skin because you are... In the first reading indicates that blood is draining outwards from the brain. What happens when the body becomes overheated or hypothermic? The main threat of the body is a high brain temperature because the limit between health and death is quite short. On the cold side, you may cool your body very low, 10 degrees, and you will not die. But on the hot side, death is quite close. It's only five degrees Celsius. There is intense heat loss on the surface of the head. Evaporative heat loss is as much as 150 watts. And this intense heat loss is transferred to the brain by convection, by the blood flowing from the skin to the internal space of the cranium. The cranium is naturally punctured by thousands of small holes. In each of the holes is a small vein, and in these veins, the blood can flow both directions. Okay, John, you may stop. Uh, I can see that you are thoroughly hyperthermic. We do exactly the same thing, right? You see the, the arrow from skin to brain, the opposite as what we had. These emissary veins through the cranium have no valves. Therefore, the blood can flow in both directions. According to Kabanak, normal blood flow is out of the brain through the emissary network. But when we experience heat stress, the flow of blood reverses. Blood cooled at the surface of the skin and flowing back through those little holes in the skull protects the heat-sensitive tissues of the brain. It took about two days 
for the light bulb to go on. And when literally in the middle of the night, I awakened thinking, my God, maybe Michelle Cabinet has a key to the mystery of why bipedalism preceded the dramatic increase in brain size. And uh, so I ran into my lab and plotted my data for brain size against my data for emissary veins. And that was the beginning of the synthesis of the radiator theory. This was exactly at the time that Walter Ann Wander had finished work on the engine of my old car. And I clearly remembered him saying that the engine can only be as big as a radiator can cool. So the whole thing just clicked together. The radiator theory remains controversial, but it draws together fossil evidence and physiology to make sense of why one kind of hominid rather than another thrived on the hot savannas. Our distant relatives, Lucy and other Australopithecines, took the first steps to becoming human. Later hominids, closer to ourselves, like the Turkana boy, had brains big enough and cool enough to produce the first technological revolution. This is the evidence. Stone tools in Africa's Rift Valley, made more than a million and a half years after we stood up. I don't believe that we would have become human without the refinement of a cranial radiator. We would have still been bipedal hominids, but brain size never would have increased beyond that which you see in the Australopithecines. So it's a cranial radiator that released the thermal constraints on brain size and permitted natural selection for an increased brain. I have never some flight out here. I always find it rather intriguing that less than a decade after mankind left its first footprints on the moon, we discovered the oldest human footprints on our own world, that is the Laetoli Trackway in East Africa. And it's possible that the chain of events set in place by the initial evolution of bipedalism led to the evolution of what we see today in terms of our modern human culture and technology, and then made it possible for us to go on and leave footprints in other worlds. Wow, Kenneth, and I get the camera. Okay, that's fair enough. Hey, anyone from 12? 